So uh, welcome to Tuesday Talk. Thank you for uh, showing out and uh, appreciate the large numbers. So let me uh, tell you what's going on with these uh, microphones. I have uh, Greg from uh, AB Specialist coming out uh, this morning and uh, he and I are going to be uh, looking at uh, some of the initial uh, plans for the AV system over in the uh, new town hall. And so one of uh, Greg's observations, I said, well, look, I've been having some problems with these uh, lapel mics, what's going on? And so the uh, federal, is it trade commission, the FTC that uh, handles uh, two-way radio communications and mics, the frequencies that we broadcast are so old <laughs> that they've, they've been reassigned to 5G networks. And so what's happening is uh, we have uh, 10, 11, 12 frequencies that we broadcast on and they were made available to 5G operators and slowly they've been grabbing these uh, frequencies. And so when I get that squelching, it's not an internal problem with the microphone or with the speakers. It's the fact that I'm, com I'm trying to uh, grab a line that's already a frequency that's already been picked up by a different provider. And so uh, there's no way to correct that uh, other than to get a new microphone with a different frequency that has now been assigned by whoever that is. Uh, and so this is coming at a really good time uh, because we have to figure out how to make this work for another 30 or 40 days uh, and then we'll be under construction in the new town hall. So great timing uh, and uh, we will muddle along with uh, some temporary mics and figure out how to make this happen. So this morning uh, we have a presentation on uh, Because We Care and so uh, Luann, come on up. Oh, I'll start over. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Luann Emerson, and I'm chairman of Because We Care. Our organization was founded some 20 years ago by a group of women who thought there was a need to help others. <clears throat> Making recycling greeting cards provided the funds. Over the years, <clears throat> Other ways were developed to generate income, such as trinkets and treasures. Since 2019, when trinkets and treasures ceased, we are now only able to fund projects on a limited basis. Sorry. Uh, our biggest expense is providing all the money to buy <clears throat> books for the libraries. Because We Care also buys flowers for new residents and long hospital stays, plus holiday gifts for shut-ins. There is also a group called the Cheer Girls <clears throat> who visit Sylvan once per month with thoughtful cards, talk, and jokes. Currently, we need, we desperately need volunteers to make recycled uh, greeting cards. Many of our workers are getting older <laughs> and without additional help <laughs> and without additional help we will not be able to produce enough cards to, pro to, pro to provide the income to fund the same amount for the libraries. Making green cards is a lot of fun and does not require artistic talent. All is needed is the ability to pay straight. <laughs> we meet every Monday from 9 to 3 in the Arts and Craft Room. Volunteers <coughs> work one hour or more. Someone is always in the Arts and Craft Room making green cards and we'll be able to help you get started. Contact Eleanor Finn, Rosa Heckman, or myself if you are interested in volunteering to make recycled greeting cards. Please help us and also, bu and also buy the cards. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. 
Hi, everybody, and I promise this will be short. Can you hear me? Okay. This is your last call. If you're interested in running for the Board of Directors of FLIPRA here at Regency Oaks, nominations will close on Sunday the 28th. So let us know if you are. I remind you that some 77% of us are now FLIPRA members. Isn't that great? And that's largely due to the generous offering of, this was, this was so good, <laughs> a grant working with new residents to fund their first year's flight for a membership. And, and they're renewing. And it's just getting better and better. So if you're interested in being part of the board, let us know. It's a three-year term if you run. And you're eligible to run for a second three-year term. Flacra board members, could you stand if you're in the room? Okay, here's some folks. You probably know some of these folks. If you have any questions, ask them between now and, and Saturday, Sunday, excuse me. And if you are interested, please put a note in the uh, Flacra mailboxes, which are in each box. Thank you. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to take a look at the uh, COVID numbers and we'll go right to the screen. So even with the uh, advent of the uh, two vaccines, the uh, Pfizer, the Moderna, and now we uh, know that Johnson is getting ready to get theirs uh, approved. They have the emergency approval getting ready to go to a full-blown distribution. Uh, and we've seen cases uh, waning over uh, Florida during the winter season. Uh, the pandemic future has uh, been obscured somewhat in recent weeks because there is a rapid spread of a new, more contagious uh, version of the virus. And this is the uh, UK version. It's called B117. Uh, and Florida, unfortunately, looks to be ground zero for the US and this new uh, variant of, of COVID. Um, there have been a number of different spin-offs uh, that have uh, uh, researchers tracking. They're looking at the one out of Africa. There's a South America version. There's a new uh, Asian version. But the one that uh, seems to have most public health officials concerned is this B117. Um, the private researchers, federal officials are predicting a, uh, that this will become the predominant strain of the new variants uh, and that we're going to, uh, uh, over the course of the next 30 to 45 days, we're going to see uh, a foothold established here in the United States. And unfortunately, it looks like Florida uh, may be leading the way. We'll take a look at uh, some of these numbers. Um, so since the uh, advent of being able to identify this in the United States, and it, I, it seems to me it occurred the, the end of December, uh, we've seen improvement in the COVID numbers here in the state of Florida. We're down about 50% when you look at new cases. Uh, that's about 16,000 cases per day. Uh, the number of people being treated by COVID in Florida hospitals, that has declined by about 30% from the peak in the middle of January. So the trend lines as we're looking at the uh, virus, uh, the original virus, we seem to be getting a handle on that. We're working toward herd immunity. People are getting vaccinated. Uh, Regency Oaks, uh, our residents uh, over uh, Ninety-seven percent are going to be completely inoculated uh, over the course of the next 10 days. Uh, and so everything seems to be headed in the right direction when we're talking about the original COVID. But when we start looking at the, uh, the UK variant, uh, UK variant, uh, we've seen confirmed cases in the country increase by 343 up from 201 earlier this week. That means yesterday. So uh, it's, uh, it's growing pretty rapidly. Uh, the most recent estimates that uh, we've seen suggest that somewhere between 10 and 15% of the new cases here in the United States are occurring in Florida. 
and uh, this particular strain of the virus is a lot more uh, contagious than the first original COVID strain and scientists are saying they believe it's 35 to 45 percent more uh, dangerous and more contagious. Uh, so it's uh, something that we really are going to have to continue to, to watch and, and worry about. So this is a uh, new sign. You're going to see this on the back of the Tuesday talk notes. Uh, this is designed specifically to help keep us safe and to uh, address the concerns about the uh, new uh, variant. Uh, it says new virus variants that spread more easily could lead to a rapid rise in COVID-19 cases. Uh, these new cases are the highest ever and they're rising. Some healthcare systems are at or near capacity and new uh, variants are emerging that spread more easily. More spread means more cases and that results in more death. And so it then talks over on the right hand side, the things that we've been practicing for a year, we've gotten really, really uh, good with this. Wearing a mask, social distancing, avoiding crowds and getting vaccinated when you have the opportunity. So we're going to, uh, you'll see these signs at the uh, front desk as we start to gear up uh, for what we know is coming. Uh, we are going to put this on the back of the Tuesday talk so you'll be able to uh, stick it on your refrigerator and keep it as a, a reference. Uh, and then we will continue just on a week in, week out basis to provide you with updates and uh, let, you, uh, let you know where we stand. Uh, the concern is you'll recall that on uh, February 18th of last year, uh, that's when we got to the point where we recognized that there was something going on and we started to make as a, uh, as a country, we started to uh, roll back and shut down. Uh, and then within 30 to 45 days, we were in full blown pandemic. And so that's the concern with this uh, uh, new variant is that the, uh, uh, the numbers are, are rapidly escalating. And so uh, next week, we'll try to provide you with a seven day running uh, history so that we can judge uh, just how rapidly this is, is spreading in the population. Okay, uh, we're going to take a look here at uh, Florida and um, see, uh, see what's happening here in Florida. You can see that uh, uh, Tampa, Hillsborough County continues to, uh, that's the darker blue. It's not the, the darkest blue, that's reserved for Miami. Uh, Broward and Dade counties, but Tampa, Hillsborough County still continues to, to be pretty active. Uh, Safety Harbor is, it's sort of hard to see, but we're a lighter shade of blue, so uh, we're making some progress there. The two charts on the right-hand side, that's just uh, uh, looking at uh, Florida data for the last uh, 30 days. You can see the trend line in yellow for new cases. It's generally declining. And then the fatalities uh, of uh, dying from COVID are really greatly improved. It's uh, about the same as uh, your uh, likelihood of dying in an airplane crash. And so we've just really seen significant improvement in the uh, fatality rates, uh, at least here in Florida for, for COVID. Let's go over to uh, Florida testing, the next one over. Oh, oh, see there are my emails, 143. <laughs> Came in since I deleted all those. <laughs> you can just, there we go. Sorry. no problem. So uh, we uh, see that our uh, positivity rate here in Pinellas County yesterday was about 7.31. Uh, again, a relatively light testing day. They only did about 3,000 tests. We've been averaging close to seven or 8,000. And so if you take a look at this, uh, the trend line, uh, the red graph down here on the bottom, uh, the positivity rate fell uh, back on about 2.7 or 2.8, it fell to 6%. Uh, it popped up just a little bit yesterday, but it's probably on the strength of the sampling size. It's about half of what we normally sample. So uh, we think that uh, you know, if we start looking at this uh, week over week, we'll continue to see a decline in 
in testing. Uh, let's go right over to health metrics. Here are the four charts we look at every week. Uh, the upper left-hand corner of the brown line, that's uh, people who are showing up in hospitals with flu-like symptoms. Uh, that's dropped off a little, but mostly uh, pretty consistent. Uh, people who are showing up with COVID-like illness in hospitals, it just continues to decline. That's the purple line uh, over on the left-hand side. <laughs> Documented new cases jumped a little bit uh, day over day from yesterday to today. Uh, and we also see a, a swing in the seven-day average. Uh, and that's also true for the laboratory testing. Uh, we do not, eat, we've looked, uh, taken a more in-depth look at these numbers. We do not think that's a start of a new upward trend. We think that is simply fluctuation in the data uh, as uh, data is dumped in from, from uh, a weekend, uh, particularly a holiday weekend. So instead of getting two days worth of data, you get three days worth of data. And so we think that's probably what is, uh, is reflected up there. All right, let's go uh, lights up. Okay, our, our numbers continue to look really good uh, here specifically at Regency Oaks. You know, we've been tracking the, uh, you know, I'm not gonna give you all the statistics, I'm just gonna go cut to the bottom line and that's the number of residents or staff here at Regency Oaks across all product lines, independent living, assisted living and skilled nursing there are no residents, there are no staff members anywhere on campus that we suspect of having COVID-like symptoms uh, or are monitoring. Uh, so this is day 16 of uh, being able to claim that. So what that, uh, what that means uh, uh, for you, what you, why you're interested in that is uh, that uh, we now meet the criteria for us to request the next uh, round of uh, loosening of restrictions as part of our reopening plan. So uh, we do that every Friday once we meet the criteria. We, we had met it by last Thursday. And so on Friday, we submitted a, a plan to uh, LCS for review and approval. It usually, the way that works is if we submit one Friday, the next Friday we get our answer. Uh, so this next Friday, I expect to uh, get an answer as to uh, what we requested. It's pretty ambitious. Uh, we uh, had 12 additional restrictions that we're trying to uh, go with. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we laid out and documented a case that's uh, strong enough to uh, get us back to uh, full operations or, or something closely resembling that. So look for uh, that information uh, to come later this week. We are expecting it on Friday. Grant, aren't we in better shape than other communities like us? We, we are in really, <laughs> yeah, we, we're in really good shape. Uh, one are, you know, there are other communities that have gone through the uh, vaccination process. There aren't any other communities that have 97%. <laughs> Uh, same way is true with our associates. Our initial uh, uh, associate response was a little slow. Uh, and after that first uh, uh, COVID vaccination clinic, uh, we only had about 41% participation with our associates. We're all the way up to almost 70% with our associates and that's we're really satisfied with that number. I've mentioned before, we've, we're not getting participation from the kids. And so we, uh, we employ about 50 minors uh, and their parents are, are pretty clear that for them, it doesn't make a lot of sense for them to participate in the vaccine. And, and uh, I understand the reasoning and I support it. Uh, the CDC has been saying all along since the, the start of this that young people are not impacted by COVID and there's no need for them to get vaccinated. And then the second thing that they say is when you think about someone uh, our age, the long-term side effects are not quite as long as the long-term <laughs> side effects <laughs> for, for someone who's, who's 16. So if you, back, if you back those numbers up, our 
uh, if you if just take those 50 kids out of the equation, then our numbers uh, jump up into the, the high 80s. Uh, so we uh, have, um, just as a reminder, we do have the last of the scheduled COVID clinics. Uh, it is confirmed for this Saturday. Uh, we have about 108 uh, residents and staff who will be receiving the second dose, uh, the booster shot. Uh, if you have not received the first shot, uh, you will not have an opportunity to participate in this clinic. We have requested uh, a third clinic, but we don't have confirmation on that. That would be another series uh, where we'd be able to uh, open it up to your relatives, your family members, your sisters and great aunts and next door neighbors. And uh, so uh, we, uh, we have offered to, to do that. We think it's a, a great uh, offer. Uh, I'm, I'm really proud of my staff. They offered to uh, give up a weekend and come in and do it at, at no charge to CVS uh, because we've gotten really efficient at this. Uh, the last clinic we did 508 people uh, and uh, CVS just doesn't have anybody who's doing those kind of numbers. And so what we've offered is, look, if you're interested, we can, we can get you five, 600 people here on a Saturday. Our staff will run the clinic for you uh, and we'll donate our time to uh, make sure that our residents and their families uh, have the same opportunity to, to be safe and vaccinated. So we'll keep you up to date on that uh, as we move forward. So a couple of uh, other updates here for you. This is, uh, this is sort of exciting because we're, uh, we're going to start transitioning back to some more normal Tuesday talk uh, functions. I've got five or six things to talk about that are not COVID related. So this is, this is encouraging. Uh, we have a new wellness nurse, and many of you may know her. It's uh, Nikki Simmons. Anyone know Nikki? She was a uh, nurse with uh, our old Brookdale Home Health Agency, Nurse on Call. Uh, she's, been with, uh, she's been here at Regency for years and years and years. Uh, and so when uh, Nurse Diane left, uh, we had an opportunity to go back and uh, take one of our, our former associates that really did a great job. And so she's going to be our uh, new wellness nurse and, and look for her uh, to be out on the floor uh, and uh, once she gets through uh, the orientation and onboarding process. We also, this is uh, uh, pretty exciting. Uh, it's, uh, and I, I share this just because it's, uh, it, w it really won't have any direct impact for you. Uh, but it does talk about LCS and their commitment to the scholarship fund and, and how, you know, if we uh, invest in education and, and building uh, for tomorrow by investing in our uh, young folks today, that uh, that's a, a philosophy that they embrace and that I endorse. Uh, and so related to that, we have uh, five uh, associate administrators. This is the class of 2017. And so these uh, five young uh, people uh, were selected back in calendar year 2015. Uh, and they uh, uh, used LCS scholarship funds uh, to go and get a bachelor's degree uh, and uh, it make advancement toward working in healthcare. And uh, all of them desire to be administrators, uh, skilled nursing home administrators, uh, or eventually executive directors. And so as a part of that, LCS has also guaranteed uh, an AIT program, an administrator in training. Uh, and here in the state of Florida, it's a one-year program. It has to be under the auspices of uh, a skilled nursing home administrator or executive director. And Regency Oaks has been awarded one of the uh, class of 17. So we have uh, a young kid by the name of uh, Evan Poole, uh, and he's going to be joining us as an associate uh, administrator reporting directly to Kyle, our new skilled nursing home administrator. 
And Evan has uh, graduated, is a recent graduate, a baby graduate of uh, Indiana State University where he received his Bachelor's of Science in Health Science Administration. Uh, and he has a uh, concentration in healthcare administration with a minor in business management. So he's uh, worked at Westminster Village uh, up in Indiana, which is uh, an LCS community for five years. Uh, and so we're really excited to be able to uh, offer this uh, position to this young man and to give him the experience uh, and the start to a career that uh, each of us will get to, to help shape. So uh, I'll have him to a Tuesday talk as, as soon as he gets on board and we can welcome him and uh, wish him well. Pizza oven. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. So the uh, pizza oven has uh, been red flagged. And so the pizza oven, we followed all the processes and the correct procedures. We went down to the uh, building department. We got a permit before we ever started work on it. Uh, you know, everything was run to code. It was uh, in the drawings, in the plans. And so a long uh, uh, week before last comes uh, an organization that we're not really f that familiar with, but it was a uh, uh, Department of Business and Professional Regulations, the Office of Hotels and Restaurants Enforcement Division. <laughs> Big business card. <laughs> and, <laughs> And so these people came out and they said, well, you, you can't do that. And well, well, what do you mean? Well, if you have that pizza oven there, it has to be in a uh, screened enclosure, has to have a, a hard roof, has to have uh, a powered exhaust fan, has to have a locking door, has to have a fire extinguisher. Uh, and it's like, well, you know, where were you in the permitting review <laughs> process? Because I got a permit that says I can do this. And so... Um, the next thing that happened is, uh, so they, they red tagged it, and then once you red tag something, the other agencies start to come out, and the health department came out, and they said, no, nah, it looks good to me. <laughs> Fire department came out and said, no, nah, it looks good to us. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I don't know where, where we stand. We, are, we, we got consultants and uh, attorneys involved, and we're, we're, we'll work through this, but the Pizza Hut is, is uh, uh, on hold as we uh, fight the bureaucratic uh, uh, <laughs> obstacles that, that have presented itself. Um, leading age, uh, uh, um, I had a conversation yesterday with uh, Steve, who is the uh, executive director of Leading Age, and they are another strong uh, organization that supports what we do in, in CCRCs. They were instrumental in our fight to get the vaccine uh, here at Regency Oaks. Um, and they have uh, joined forces with FLICRA on many occasions to uh, advance causes for, for the senior population. So I've got Steve uh, uh, convinced he's never been to Regency Oaks. And I said, well, look, uh, you really need to come see our community. It's beautiful. We have great resident participation. So Steve, uh, in, in the course of the next two to three weeks, is scheduling a time to come down and do a presentation for residents. Uh, and so I'll keep you updated. I'd like to get a large uh, Regency Oaks response. I think uh, Steve has great information. He's going to be speaking on some current topics that will be of interest to you. Uh, he's going to be addressing the upcoming legislative session, uh, how it's going to impact uh, seniors at Regency Oaks. He's going to be addressing the liability uh, issue associated with COVID and how that's going to impact long-term care in our state. Uh, so it'll, I think it'll be a really informative session and look for that over the course of the next couple of weeks. I tried to convince him to come for a, a Tuesday talk. He uh, uh, his, his secretary is going to get back to us today with a, a date. So as soon as I have that date, we'll, we'll publicize that. Um, 
I mentioned that we had an audiovisual initial meeting this morning in the town hall. We also, on Wednesday, uh, will be a sh uh, our interior design team is going to be here uh, for an initial presentation of the uh, hard services surfaces, uh, and they'll be sharing that with uh, uh, Lou Weislovo and the design committee. And so we'll get to actually see the fabrics and the wallpaper and the tiles and the carpeting. Uh, and so it's, it's really hard to judge that stuff when you're looking at it on a, a TV screen. So we are very close. These are the last two meetings that we need to firm up the plan. Uh, and then after that, we will be doing a, a full resident presentation uh, on the design scheme and sharing with you uh, that color palette as well. So that's uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. North building, uh, water issues. Uh, we've had, <laughs> I, I guess I could just wait and see if anyone asks me any question on it. But, <laughs> but uh, we, we've had a, had a bit of a mess. Uh, uh, Sunday we lost a circulation pump that uh, fed one of the boilers and the circulation pump didn't just quit working. We didn't get that lucky. Uh, it blew out the bearings, and so it literally was pumping hundreds of gallons of uh, water uh, uh, out into the, uh, into the boiler room, and it bled down, and it took out the two uh, public restrooms on the second floor, and it took out the front lobby, and so it, it did pretty extensive damage. Um, we had uh, Bannock uh, come in, and uh, of course, uh, you know, even though we had a backup pump, uh, you know, I was, uh, really thought Darwin did a great job in uh, being prepared and having a backup pump in case this ever happened. Because, you know, trying to get one in the middle of COVID, it wasn't going to happen. So Darwin had a backup pump, but. Uh, Brannick brother didn't have uh, couplers, connections, or gaskets, <laughs> so they were <laughs> they were here Sunday and said, "Yep, that's what it is." Um, and, <laughs> and so Monday morning, they they were here first thing Monday morning. They put the backup pump in. They got everything up and running. So we uh, we never lost water, but we did lose hot water. Uh, uh, Sunday, Monday morning, 9.30, everything was back up and running, thought things were going great. Uh, last night, we started getting phone calls, I guess as, as people started to uh, go in and take showers, uh, we started getting phone calls that the hot water was coming out of the cold water and the cold water was coming out. <laughs> so they, they, were, they were back out this morning, <laughs> and uh, I understand. I understand it's corrected, but uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, thank you for your patience and your understanding as we work through that. And one of the things that we we talked about this earlier, and we're going to uh, we're going to have to uh, talk about it with our communication and technology committees. Uh, we do have new technology that allows us to uh, broadcast information, but we really haven't set the parameters and. You know, at, at first glance, it's like, oh, well, you know, th that's, that's really easy. But it, it's, it's not. And so I sort of, uh, to illustrate a point, I said, well, okay, what, what, am I, what can I think of? How many of you get those annoying calls two, three times a day sometimes on renewing your expired car <laughs> warranty? <Yeah. laughs> okay. <laughs> so we all get, like, five of those a week, six of those a week, and, and you know, it just irritates the living daylights out of me. And, and so I don't want our new capability to become uh, something where I'm sending out 30 of those a month and you're ignoring them, and every time you see it, you're just you know, pushing the red button because you, you're just sick and tired of it. And so one of our challenges, and, and we've got to figure this out, is how do we set the parameters for contacting residents? Is it just information? Is it an emergency? Uh, what constitutes an emergency? And it's a sort of a change in how we communicate. So in, in the past, if there was uh, something like this, the front desk was fully aware. A fire alarm system went off, you called the front desk, they could give you an update. We had a water issue, you called the front desk, you got an update. 
Um, we, if we had something scheduled, uh, you know, the water is going to be off next Thursday from 10 to 2. Those are the kind of things where we would give you a notice in your mailbox or maybe we would use the old robocall system when they were scheduled. And so we've just got to really think through as a community, how do you want to be contacted? Do you want uh, every emergency, every um, uh, situation that develops? And I, I thought of an example here as well. Uh, you know, you're, you're driving down the road and you come up to a detour. Did Pinellas County send you a notice saying that they were going to be working on a water main that broke and that you shouldn't go that way? No. What happens? You drive upon it and then you have to sort of figure out how to detour around it. And so there are some, some legitimate questions uh, in terms of prioritizing and setting protocols. And so I, my, my commitment back to you is I think we probably could have done a better job of communicating what was going on. I'm not quite sure how we ought to do it, and so uh, we are going to reach out with our communication technology committees and try to set up a protocol so that we can take the best advantage of the new technology that's available to us and try to just get a better handle on this as, as we move forward. Okay, that is everything I have, and we're working with two microphones today, so Don's going to... Uh, handle the microphones and just for efficiency we're going to sort of start over here and work that way because Harry usually helps me but I don't have a third mic. Is it hot? Yeah it is. I would have one suggestion on use of the robocalling. Sunday morning the fire alarm went off at 7 o'clock. Most of us bounced out of bed quickly in our nightgown. Were we supposed to get dressed and be ready to evacuate, or do we just go make a coffee? Uh, we have no idea. So, of course, you know, you first thing as you do put on some clothes, but other than that, then afterward, how do we know when it's all clear? I think especially an all clear after a fire alarm would be wonderful for everybody to know that, okay, it's safe for you to open your door now and go on with whatever. Yeah, great point. Um, and so just FYI, uh, we are going to, we already committed in the month of March, we were going to move the uh, fire training up. We usually do that in June uh, with the hurricane, but we're going to move it up. We're going to do it in March because we didn't do fire training with you last year. And so just to reiterate, uh, if in the event of a fire or a fire alarm or a fire drill, Stay in your apartment, do not open your door. We will contact you. Uh, and that's always our, our, uh, been our plan here is we want you to shelter in place. Uh, we don't want you creating drafts in the corridors. We don't want you opening up a, a door to a smoky hallway and putting your life at risk. And so you stay in place unless the fire is in your apartment, obviously. But. <laughs> <laughs> But, but if, if it's not in your apartment, you stay in place and we will come to you uh, because our building is uh, solid cinder block construction, even between apartments. You have a solid concrete roof, a solid concrete floor underneath you. You're fully sprinkled. You have uh, contained uh, fire walls uh, every 75 feet. You have two hour fire rated doors on every single apartment. So we have time to respond and make sure that you are evacuated appropriately. But to Bobby's point, that's a great idea. After a fire alarm, uh, rather than having everybody call the front desk, it's probably much easier for me to call everyone and tell them what the status update is. That's a great point. Robin. Hi. Okay. Um, Back to COVID, I'm sorry for questions about the variant. We know it's more infectious. Is it more deadly, number one? And number two, if you're vaccinated, what protection do you have? So the great question, the early indicators is that this new UK strand is in fact more deadly. At first, uh, they didn't think that was the case. And, and I think the true answer 
uh, is they honestly don't know because they only have 350 cases so far. And so I think that's an emerging situation and we're going to find out. They do know uh, that it's 45% it's more contagious. They do know that those first 350 people have gotten sicker uh, quicker than with the uh, regular strand of COVID. And they know that uh, just like the COVID vaccine is not going to prevent you from getting the original COVID, it's just going to uh, make sure your symptoms are not severe. They're only going to be mild. That's the question. If, if this is uh, more contagious and it makes you more sick, you know, are, is it going to prevent you from getting it? No. And so you're at the same risk as the general population. They do think that the COVID vaccine will keep the symptoms from becoming severe, but you may be sicker than if you had gotten the first uh, variety of COVID. Oh, isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but, you know, it, it's, uh, but, but, but here's the thing. Uh, <laughs> They don't, they don't know anything. And, and so, because I, I want you to think about that. So think about February 18th of last year, what we thought we knew and what actually turned out to be true. It was completely different. And so at this point, here's the approach that we're taking. We're going, to, we're going to keep you up to date. We're going to provide you with the information. It's going to change over time. And, and you know, it's, we are going to develop a strategy as, as, the, as we learn more information and we become more familiar with the characteristics of these uh, different uh, uh, varieties that are, are going to, uh, to happen. And, and just, you know, remember also that this is more like a flu than it is a polio vaccine. So every single year, you get a flu shot. It's never the same flu shot, right? It's been adjusted for the uh, change in the, in the virus. The same thing is happening with COVID. And so I know it's sort of scary because COVID is, is, is mutating and it's becoming something different, but they, they always expected that to happen. And so I think my personal take is, you know, we saw COVID last year, we have a new COVID this year. We're going to see a new COVID next year. This is going to become very much like the flu. That's, that's my take after reading all the, the articles that, that I've, I've read on it. What is the current visit for policy? So the question is, what is the current visitor uh, policy? There are no restrictions as to the number of individuals who are allowed to visit either individually in your apartment or globally in each building. Visitors are limited to uh, your apartment and the corridors. Visitors are still not allowed to eat, ex uh, eat at an outdoor setting or an indoor setting. So they're limited to your apartment and access to and from. So they, they can't be in the common areas. They, they only, only as a means of egress. That's correct. All right. Uh, you're back on the uh, fire prevention. As a son of a fireman and the father of a fireman, open flames in the apartments are forbidden. Candles, etc. That's a good thing to remind everybody of. Yeah, and so in March, uh, that's, that's a great point, Chris, and so in March, uh, one of the things that we talk about is what you should uh, uh, look for in terms of a fire uh, safety analysis of your apartment. We, it's something we offer to do. Uh, it's frayed electrical cords. It's no open candles, no barbecue grills. Um, we, <laughs> we, <laughs> John, was, John was driving around uh, uh, one Wednesday, Thursday, two weeks ago, and he said he was driving down the Perma Road. It was uh, it was dark. It wasn't dark, dark, but it was dark enough that you really couldn't see. And he said he saw these huge flames uh, coming from uh, an apartment lanai, and it was oh, a, a new resident who had fired up his uh, Weber. <laughs> and so, so 
So that's part of what we'll go over in March is just what the, the rules are and what to look for. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, th I don't think John went to investigate. I think he went over for a steak. <laughs> that's just my guess. <laughs> Judith. Did I just understand you to say that it's no longer limited to 10 people per building per day? That's correct. So if I, if, if I want four children to come to our apartment, they only have, all they have to do is check in? Yes. Thank you. All right, so we're not taking reservations anymore? No. The people can just come. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Come on over. Yeah, that changed somewhere back at, oh, I forget the exact date. It was in December. Yeah, yeah fell for it. <laughs> okay, yeah, not required. We'll, we'll get that corrected here at the front desk. Grant, what's the current visitation policy on Sylvan? Uh, so the the current situation at Sylvan, what's the uh, visitation policy? It is uh, Harry is getting ready to change. Uh, Sylvan has been on lockdown for, for twenty one days, something like that, and we had we had an exposure. And uh, when you have an exposure, you have to, in, in a licensed building, you have to test uh, every day or twice a week. Um, and we had just come out of that when the positivity rate bumped back up. And when the positivity rate uh, happen, bumps up, you have to test twice a week and you're still on lockdown. But we just finished the, uh, if you can go 21 days, without an outbreak it gives you the ability to take the next steps and so we just did our 21st day without an outbreak and so uh, Kyle will be announcing uh, restrictions um, Kyle's off today and so I don't know if he's uh, he's done that yet but that that's going to be happening all right Bill has a question there in the back Okay, I just uh, have a question going back to the uh, visitors coming in. Can they can we get food, take out food from the dining room and feed them in the apartment? Absolutely. So the question is, if you have a visitor coming in and you would like to, to have lunch or dinner uh, in the apartment, uh, yes, you are, are welcome to get takeout and, and bring it to the apartment and your guests can uh, enjoy a meal with you. Yes. <clears throat> when will the tavern open for lunch? <laughs> so, so I, 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 well, the question is, when will the tavern open for lunch? Oh, yeah. And I can tell you, I, I, I didn't read all 12 uh, items because, you know, I don't want to get your hope up unnecessarily. But one of the 12 uh, was reopening the tavern for lunch. Uh, and I'm pretty confident that one's going to get approved. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you one more. Uh, the other one, and I'm conf I'm pretty confident this one isn't going to get approved. Uh, but the other one that we asked for was to uh, reopen the salad bars um, with with precautions, and we had uh, come up with a very detailed uh, twelve step uh, plan to keep residents safe at the salad bar. Uh, but I don't I don't know if I can get anyone to sign off on that. What about the breezeway? Uh, that breezeway is open. And so who has the breezeway dates? Uh, Margaret, do you have the breeze March dates? March 9th. March 9th. Is the first, one. first one. So uh, <coughs> yeah. Sign up sheets are available. Breezeway is coming back. Pizza oven is That's and on hold. Tuesday and Thursday. Yeah. And it's it's the full crowd. I'm sorry. Um, back to the dining with family in your apartment. Are you saying that if you wanted to have your four grandchildren over and everybody eat in the apartment, we can you can order your own meal plus the four meals 
yes. Meal for the other yeah, people. Yeah, guest meals, but yes. Guest meals. Yes. And whatever the guest meal price is, that's what it is. Correct. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Oh, over here. Don, you're getting your exercise this morning. <laughs> you're keeping them young. He won't have to go to the gym today. <laughs> Spend more time with Norma Jean. Uh, the question about the dining just came up and the guest meal prices. I purchased four guest meal tickets way back. Would they still be honored? If I sure. them? Yes. Okay, that's it. Yeah. So, so, so let me just let me just restate that. So when you say way back. <laughs> <laughs> So you'll, you'll remember we had a situation a couple of years ago where uh, someone got smart and they figured out that all they had to do is our guest tickets were on pink paper or something, I forget what it was, but all they had to do is go and run an old one on pink paper and we would accept it. And so those, we, we gave an amnesty of 120 days and you had to burn them off. And so now all the new guest tickets that we accept, they never expire, but they're, they're stamped. They're, a very specific Regency Oaks guest meal ticket and so if when you say way way back if you try to bring one of those pink Xerox uh, <laughs> those are no longer valid but if you have a, a current within the last two or three years the, the actual Regency Oaks guest meal ticket we do accept those and they, they never expire would you explain the to the new about. Yeah. So, so, so if uh, if you want to um, uh, if you want to have a guest in your apartment, you can purchase a guest uh, meal. Most people don't use the guest meal tickets uh, because they just have a guest in, and they at the at the table they tell the server please add this to my account, and the guest meal goes directly on the account. However, there was a program, and Margaret, it's still there, and Margaret may have to help me, but it seems to me if you bought five, you got a six one free. Uh, is that right? Yeah, Bobby says that's right. So a lot of people, because they could get that uh, six one free, it was like a, a loyalty rewards, a lot of people liked to buy the guest ticket and then just turn them in because they got one free. So, smart idea if you have a lot of the guests. The only problem was, you turn the guest ticket in, they ask you to turn it in at the desk, then the server puts it through and you get charged twice. They use the ticket and they still charge it. So then you have to go see somebody and get that straight. <laughs> yeah. So we do have a, a new POS system that um, is, is <laughs> it doesn't, it's not turned on, uh, but, but, uh, but we, we, again, as part of the, the new technology initiative, we have a brand new POS system that is uh, going to be a, a lot more uh, capable. Is this new from last year? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is the one that was that we put in last year. And it's uh, it's it's up and running, but it's not really operating. Right, right. So. All right. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate everybody coming out. Have a great day. <laughs>